All right, guys, good morning. It's good to see you. I apologize for uh, not being on the porch this morning, but it's cold in Florida. And I'm sure if you're north of us, it's a lot more, it's uh, a lot colder than it is here. Uh, but I do not like cold weather at all. And so I uh, came inside this morning to uh, do my recording. I hope that you had a amazing Christmas with family, uh, remembering the greatest gift of all, which is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And, uh, and now, of course, we're beyond the Christmas uh, day. And so now we're looking at the new year and what that's gonna look like. This morning's message is gonna be a challenge for um, what your new year, what are your goals? What are you, what are you looking to achieve? And uh, spiritually, physically, emotionally, all those things. And so hope you'll tune in for that. Um, but we are in the book of Mark this morning looking at one of my favorite um, miracles. Obviously, it was a favorite of um, the gospel writers because they all four recorded this uh, particular miracle. It's the only one of the miracles that Jesus did that all four gospels um, chose to include. And uh, it is an incredible miracle. Uh, I would say um, I would say the raising of the dead would be a bigger miracle. But, uh, you know, it's, it's not about what's big or little, it's, it's the scope, what, what this teaches us as, uh, as Christians, um, as followers of Christ, what this teaches us about our Christ, about our Savior, and then what it teaches us about ourselves. And so, if you have your Bibles, turn over with me to Mark chapter 6. We're going to be looking at um, 11, 12 verses today, verses 30 through 41. And um, so I uh, hope you'll follow along with me in your word. It begins this way. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. And so if you'll remember, we had a kind of interlude last week where um, we went through the story of the beheading of John the Baptist um, and what that entailed. And, and, um, and so, but Jesus had sent his disciples out after... Um, his rejection at Nazareth, they had gone out into the countryside and Jesus had sent the disciples out two by two and, uh, he, and he told them that um, they were to not take provisions for themselves, but they were to rely on the goodness of God and him moving through people to meet their needs. All right, that's a tremendous lesson in that that I need to learn. Uh, I would imagine I'm not the only one but that I need to learn that, you know, what God provides is enough unless you want more than what God will provide. And then there's the, the problem, but not the lesson for this morning. Um, so told them to go out. Well, now they have come back from that missionary journey, uh, just uh, this interlude out into the countryside, two by two. Uh, and I know Judas went uh, because they went by twos and there were 12 of them. So, uh, so Judas would have been obviously one of these uh, 12 that have gone out. And so they're coming back to Jesus. I'm sure excited about what Jesus had empowered them. If you'll remember, Jesus uh, commissioned them and gave them the authority to cast out demons, to heal and to teach in his name. And so um, couldn't have done it without the authority of Jesus Christ. And that's the centrality of Christ is if you're going to do godly things, you've got to have God's permission and you've got to have God's power um, and you've got to have God's purpose. And so um, they were given that permission. Now they have come back in from a successful uh, independent uh, ministry in that Jesus wasn't individually with them and he wasn't the forefront of the ministry, he was in, he was acting through them into their ministry. So cover a lot more space with um, six teams of of two versus one team of thirteen. And so uh, and so they've gone out now. They've come back in to report to Jesus what they had done and what they had taught. They're worn out. I mean, they have had some serious ministry time. Um, obviously, ministry is a lot of fun. There's a lot of enthusiasm in it when you get to see people healed, uh, people coming to 
Christ. I mean, there's a lot, but it's very, very, very tiring. And I, you know, if you've never ministered um, in a in a in the forefront, then you really don't understand that tiring. Uh, but it is it, it is exhausting in every one of your areas, both physically exhausting, but also mentally and emotionally exhausting, and then spiritually exhausting sometimes as well. And so Jesus tells them um, that they're going to go, let us go off by ourselves, and notice that he tells them to go to a quiet place. Um, a, a place, not necessarily with the absence of noise, but a place where they can truly find rest for the whole body, not just for the physical, or let's go to some resort and get massages and drink drinks with umbrellas in it, but let's go away to a quiet place, a place of reflection, a, a place of realignment, a place where we can rest not only our bodies, but our spirits, our, our um, emotions. Um, you know, just let's go to a place like that and rest for a while, no specific time given. He said this because there were so many people coming and going um, that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat a lot of times. I mean, yeah, this is some serious, I mean, listen, when you start diving into my time to eat, you start messing with me. And so, you know, they're not even having time to eat. And this is a 24 seven ministry. It's not one that happens on the Sabbath day or one that happens on every Thursday, but this is one that happens every day. They are continually bombarded by people coming to Jesus, but now that they also have been given the authority to do these things, they now have a whole different level uh, going on with them. So Jesus recognizes that in himself and obviously knows that that's going on with his um, followers as well. And so he says, let's go to this quiet place so we can rest um, because we have really just been kind of bombarded and we need time. So they left by boat for a quiet place. So understand they were, he said, let's go to a quiet place and they left to actually accomplish that goal, to go to a quiet place where they could be, and here's the key, alone, <laughs> out, of the, out of the eye of the people, out of the demand of the people, a place where they could do some self-reflection, a place where they could do some self-examination, some healing, some he can do some personal teaching with them. And uh, so they left to go to that place. So there's the goal. As Jesus said, let's go to this place um, and, and get some quiet. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving. And people from many towns ran ahead along the shore to go there ahead of them. And so <laughs> there's, a, there's a leak in Jesus' entourage because these people, you know, maybe they figured it out on their own, but I, I kind of doubt it. Somebody spilled the beans about where they were going. And so while Jesus and them were getting on a boat to go, these people were literally running along the shore, running along the roads, heading to the place that they know he's going to be next, uh, the quiet place. Um, they recognized, and so they ran ahead and got there ahead of them. So, you know, imagine this. Imagine that you're going on a, a, a vacation and you, your work has has just been horrific. The family life is it's just you know you're just ready to get away from it all. And you uh, along the journey, you and the people that you're with, maybe your wife or your family or or maybe just yourself, and you're thinking, oh man, I really need this. I just can't wait. And you, in your mind, you're formulating all the things you know how you're going to accomplish the purpose of rest. And uh, so all those uh, sugar plums dancing in your head kind of thing is going on. And when you get to that spot, uh, your boss is there with your computer or your workload and say, oh, so glad you're here. Here, would you do this, do this, do this, whatever, whatever you're, or, you know, whatever you're, um, the babysitter uh, says, oh, I happen to be in the same place, so why don't you watch your own kids? You know, that kind of thing. You have in your mind and out of way, but no, the babysitter's at the restaurant and she dumps your kids on you. So, so that's the idea here, is that they've gone, but many people recognize where they were going. They got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the crowd. So 
So they're coming ashore and um, to the quiet place, and there's this tremendous crowd there, and Jesus saw them. Now, Randall Jesus would have said, get row further down the coast. We ain't stopping. Act like you didn't see them. Act like you didn't see them. You know the, you know the routine. I mean, because they're, they're physically exhausted. This isn't like they just got away because they wanted a vacation. Literally, these people are exhausted. These guys are exhausted. And so, you know, Jesus sees them. What emotion, what, uh, because he's tired too. Remember, he's human. He's, he's, um, he feels all the struggles that all of us feel. And so um, with, with us, you know, obviously, and perhaps you're a better person than I am, and, and I'm sure many of you are, but for me, I would say, I don't know, we just can't. You know, we just, we, we've gone to rest. Jesus, you said we were going to rest, and so we just need to row on down the, uh, the river a little bit or whatever. And uh, so Jesus sees the crowd as he stepped from the boat, and the Bible says he has something crazy for them. He has compassion. Wow. The centrality of Christ, if we're going to follow Christ, one of our central attributes to, to mimic Jesus is compassion in any circumstance. Now, compassion looks differently, obviously, and I understand that, but Jesus saw their need. And, you know, he, what's interesting is that he didn't see it apparently and be aggravated, nor did he see it and say, ooh, big crowd here, let's pass the plate. He had compassion on them. I mean, here's, here's a group of people who are starved for truth. The, the shepherds of, each, of, of Israel are not doing their job. The people are wandering lost and so here's a rabbi uh, in their mind, uh, in, in some minds a great prophet, a great healer, um, that is telling us the truth. And they, some, you know, some folks just can't get enough of it, even to the point they put their lives on hold and just run to wherever he is and, um, and just want to be near him, just want to hear him. And the miraculous thing about this particular story is we don't see any miracles as far as healing and people being raised from the dead. We do see a miracle that, that maybe most of them didn't even know happened. Um, and, and I'll explain that in just a minute. But, um, but they're just hungry for truth. They're hungry for hope. They're hungry for something beyond what the world can offer them. And, and so they, they get there and Jesus has compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Absolutely. So he began teaching them many things. And so Jesus has compassion on them. Notice that he doesn't say, oh, here's a hundred bucks, go, you know, whatever your issue is, go tend to it, you know. Notice he didn't just start handing out food and let them leave, but he he gave them what they needed. It, maybe it wasn't what they particularly wanted, at least all of them, but he gave them what they needed, which was teaching because they were so hungry for truth. They, and when they got a little bit of it, they wanted more of it. And so he began to teach them many things. And by many things, it means that it was a long sermon, guys. And so, and, and what we see is it, it's now late afternoon. So between... 34 and 35, there's a time lapse here. So Jesus is teaching, 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 and now it is late after moon. Noon. They're in a desolate spot. So, you know, um, I used to live in a little town. My mom was from a little town called Elamville. Beautiful little town in the middle of nowhere. Um, but uh, a lot of my best childhood memories are from um, Elamville. And so, um, but it's 30 minutes almost from anything. Uh, you know, things have got a little closer to it now. And, of course, with, uh, with automobiles and things, you can get there quicker and better roads, that kind of thing. But it's just an out-of-the-way spot. doesn't even have, unless they've gotten one recently, doesn't even have uh, a little general store, you know, to buy milk and things. I mean, literally, you have to go away to get. And, and this place kind of reminds me of an Elamville where he's, he's teaching, uh, you know, they, they wanted to come. 
but there's really nowhere for them to quickly go and get, you know, something to eat, uh, somewhere to rest and that kind of thing. And so for the people that are there, so it's late after the noon and the disciples came and, and <laughs> um, came to him and said, you know, I wonder, this is Randall, I wonder if this is all they said to him or this is all they were willing to record that they said to him. But notice their solution. You know, because again, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not throwing a rock at them because I think I'd be very, I would be aggravated. I think um, because Christ is not central to me. Christ was not central to them, even though they were walking with him. Um, they've just had this amazing experience. But hey, we, we're beyond that. Now it's time for us to rest, and you've taken this part of our time already a whole, um, the best part of a day, and you've sat down and taught these people. So listen, okay, got it, you did it, thank you, that's wonderful. But let's send them away because this is a remote place. Um, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they, you know, so, so <laughs> they're making it seem, and we do this, you do this, I do this. They're making it seem as if I'm doing you a favor by sending you away, you know. Um, you know, it's not that I want you to go away. It's that, oh, oh, for your good, I'm going to send you away. And uh, <laughs> really, you can see so much of human nature in this story. Send the crowds away to the nearby villages so they can buy something to eat. And Jesus rocks their world. So he sent them out with nothing. And uh, so, so remember, let's backtrack to Jesus said, listen, don't take any provision. Don't take a money sack. Don't take extra clothes. Don't take blah, blah, blah. He sent them out so that they would learn to rely on God for their needs. All right. Now he's about to teach them a bigger lesson on that same topic, but now he's going to take it to a whole new level. Okay. So Jesus in verse 37 rocks their world. I can imagine when that when he says verse 37, that their eyes have to be like, oh, what are you talking about? Okay. Um, you're going to hear it in their response to him, but th listen to it. You feed them. <laughs> With what? what are we, we don't even have food. This is a remote place. We don't possibly have, we don't possibly have enough money to buy food for all these people. And even if we could, there's nowhere to buy it. We're in a desolate place. We're in a remote place that we came to rest. And you want us now to feed all these people with what? <laughs> That's what they say. With what? They ask you. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money. I, I wrote down in my notes uh, somewhere. It's a. It was two years. Let me see if, if I can find it real quick. I think it was two years of wages they would add to work or something. It was a. It was a ridiculous amount of time that they would have to work in order to just get enough money. Two hundred denarii. Um, uh, yeah, 200 denarii, I guess I didn't write it down, but they would have to work a long time to get that kind of money. And of course, we didn't come here to work. We came here for a rest, and now you're telling us to feed them with what? So Jesus says, uh, a second thing, how much bread do you have? In other words, what do you have at hand? What do you have that we could use. Think beyond the impossibilities to what you have that would be possible. So how much bread do you have? I mean, obviously they have some bread they knew they were going to a remote spot. And so they brought some provision, but you know, maybe they brought enough for 12. They haven't brought enough for upwards of 10,000 people. I mean, you, can you imagine <laughs> feeding? 10,000 pounds. I mean, you know, the estimates are higher than that. I'm just being a lowball here, but can you imagine feeding 10,000 people? I mean, that's crazy. And, uh, and so uh, he asked, go and find out. So in other words, you go and do the best you can and bring the best that you can do to me. All right, that, that's key, so hold that in mind. They came back and reported as they did at the first of our story, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. <laughs> wow. So that tells me they didn't go look on the boat. 
Um, but this is what we have. And it turns out, not you don't find this out in Mark, um, but in maybe John, I think, you find out that this, this lo- came from one little boy. So some mama pa- packed her little boy a lunch, some for- forward-thinking lady packs her little boy, I'm assuming, this assumption on my part, uh, her little boy a lunch, so it's enough for a, you know, a boy to have a meal on. And, uh, and, and that's it. So they've, they've gone around. We find out that Andrew actually brings this kid up. Um, but he's the one that finds him, and he brings him to Jesus. And this is what we have five loaves of bread and two fish. <laughs> oh, well, okay, that's going to do it. Yeah, some of us, I, I always get uh, tickled at our ladies. You know, not that the men don't help, but normally it's the ladies that are doing our dinners. And sometimes, of course, during this COVID season, we haven't had this, but sometimes in the past, when the crowd was bigger than the food, um, I would have to remind them, and, or they would remind me, that, uh, well, Jesus took five loaves and two fish and fed them all. So we're going to feed them all. <laughs> but anyway, so, so this is what they had to feed them all. This is what they could come up with. And they did the right thing. They, they put forth effort and energy that they could do. But they obviously, I mean, anybody understands that five loaves and two fish unless something miraculous happens, that's not going to feed these people. But they bring it. They bring the best they can do to Jesus. And, and, and here's the crux of the story. Um, you, you and I are, are very insignificant to uh, accomplish the reversal of the cultural trends of uh, the United States, or in fact, the world. Um, you know, your your individual effort, my individual effort, is not enough. And, and, and we look at it sometimes as if it all rests on me, or it all rests on you. And some of you react that way, or, you know, every... Uh, the sky's falling, chicken little kind of stuff. But I just want to tell you that you're, you're ruling out the best part of you. You, you take what you can do um, and give it to Jesus. And, and l- let's see what, what Jesus can do. So they bring it back. Um, they report, this is what we have. Then Jesus told the disciples, have everybody sit down in the green grass. This reminds me, when I, when I read this green grass, and this is then L2, when I read this, it reminded me of um, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Um, he tells to have the people all sit down in an orderly fashion, okay? I mean, there's, there's 5,000 men, so we don't know, you know, exactly how many people are there. We want a census. We just know there's around 5,000 men. And so he has them sit down in groups of 50s and 100, okay? So he has them sit down in an orderly way, obviously giving enough room between each group to be able to serve them. So they ha- he asked people then. So they sat them down in groups of fifty and a hundred. Jesus took. Okay, so, so, so here's the key. The disciples didn't take this in their hand and do this. They brought the best they could do to Jesus, and now Jesus takes it in His hand. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven, and blessed them. In other words, thank you, Father, for your provision. Now, for us, when we lift up the best we can do. We, we sometimes are so short-sighted that we think that's the extent of it. But we lift up the best we can do and say, God, thank you. I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know how you're going to do it. It may not even look the way I think it ought to. But God, thank you. Thank you. And he, 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 he held it up. And he first thanked God for the, the blessing. Um, of it, and then, after he blessed it, he uh, then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving bread to the disciples so they could con- could contribute distribute it, and so in other words, he would just keep passing it out because he wanted everybody to have enough. But th- there's only five loaves, but he just multiplies it. 
he, he's doing the impossible here. This was not possible with the disciples. This was not possible with the people seated in groups of 50 and 100. It's only possible when you give what you can do to Christ and trust him with the results. It's hard. Because I want to I want, I want be responsible for the results so I can get the credit, so I can, uh, and I want to know all the answers. Notice Jesus didn't give them the physics of this. Jesus didn't give them a lesson on, okay, now I'm about to break all this. Jesus just did it. And they kept coming to him. Don't you know that if you're in the back of the line, you know there's not going to be any bread for you. And, and notice, there's no, there's no record here that the crowd understood that's all there was. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I don't know. There's really no record that the crowd understood this. So maybe they thought they had this huge bread supply. So maybe they didn't know this was a miracle at all, but the disciples did. And it was a lesson reinforcing the lesson where he had sent them out. Trust me and I'll take care of you. When you have need, I will meet the need. Bring me the best you can do, and I will provide the rest. That's, that's the lesson here. So he keeps giving out bread um, so they could distribute to the people. He divided up the fish uh, for everyone to share. So, uh, in other words, um, you know, everyone got some. In other words, that he says, verse 42, that they ate as much as they want. In other words, they just didn't get <laughs> this little bit of bread and this little tiny piece of food. Mm. No, they got as much as they wanted. They were full. At least 5,000 people ate five loaves and two fish, and they ate till they were full. But look, not only that, afterwards the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. So God not only blesses, he blesses abundantly and above beyond what we could have ever hoped or imagined. They picked it up. Wow. What it must have felt like for those guys to, to go all the way through that, because this is actually a history lesson here, all the way through this scenario, and now they're, they're maybe because of their lack of faith, <laughs> Um, they had to pick up all this extra food. You know, there's 12 baskets of it, so there's a lot of, you know, a lot of Israel stuff in here. But, you know, but, uh, you know imagine the, their uh, wonder, but also we're supposed to be resting here, not picking up leftover food. But in their humility, they had to be humbled and maybe a little embarrassed that they didn't trust Christ in this situation. What about us? What about you? Do you trust Christ? Bring him what you have and then see what he does. See you, church.